let me be very, very clear this morning. The church has used these red letter words to force women to stay in bad marriages. The church has used this passage as an anti-homosexuality passage. I believe that this is an abuse of scripture. Now you may disagree with me as countless Christians do, but I don't think that this passage should be used in that way at all. But it has been used to keep people on the margins and keep people out of the church, when the reality is, is that passage should do exactly the opposite. Because that passage is an invitation. That passage that was read for you is an open door. That passage is an extravagant welcome to everyone who has had their hearts broken by the church and been beaten down with platitudes and placards. Have you ever been asked a question and you know that the person asking you the question doesn't really care about your response? but they're just waiting and wanting to share with you their thoughts. Because I think that's what's happening with Jesus. I think the Pharisees are asking Jesus the question about divorce, and they don't necessarily care about Jesus' thoughts, but they want to trap Jesus. They want to spew their own sermons and spout their own opinions to drown out Jesus' message. But Jesus is cool. He's wise to them. And so he invites them to share their wisdom of the law of Moses. Because they're Pharisees, and the Pharisees are big on the law of Moses. They're big on Moses. And so they go right to Moses' words written in Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is basically an entire speech attributed to Moses. And Moses is the greatest prophet and greatest leader in the history of the Israelites. Moses is the man, the man. So to understand what the Pharisees really are asking, we have to unpack a little of what Moses actually says in Deuteronomy. Chapter 22, verse 13. If a man takes a wife and after lying with her, dislikes her and slanders her and gives her a bad name saying, I married this woman, but when I approached her, I did not find proof of her virginity. Then the girl's father and mother shall bring proof that she was a virgin to the town elders at the gate. Yes, folks, you heard that right. The husband lies with her and then slanders her and the burden of the proof falls to the girl and her parents. As if that weren't horrible enough, let's get the town elders involved because that seems completely reasonable. And here's the kicker. If it turns out that he is wrong, after he has accused and slandered her, the punishment, he has to pay a hundred shekels to the girl's father, and then, this is part of the punishment for him, she shall continue to be his wife, and he must not divorce her as long as he lives. Further, in the law of Moses, if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay the girl's father 50 shekels. But he must marry the girl, for he has violated her, and he can never divorce her as long as he lives. All that being said, Moses is good with divorce under certain circumstances. 
It could be as simple as the husband is tired of his wife. The husband, and this is a procedure, the husband could then write a certificate of dismissal, and it's very important, he places it in her hand, and then send her away. And commentaries said that this was done to protect the woman, because now she has a document, which is better than being a divorcee with no paperwork. So a few decades before Jesus is born, the two most famous rabbis, Hillel and Shammai, debated the interpretation of Deuteronomy, chapter 24. And we all remember how that debate went. I'll remind you. Since rabbis believed that every word in Scripture was there for a reason, they debated what the causes for divorce should be. Now, Hillel believed that a man could leave his wife for any reason, any cause at all, any cause. Shammai, on the other hand, thought that Deuteronomy 24 only referred to sexual immorality and that any cause divorce was wrong. Hillel's any cause divorce was popular among Jewish men. It was much easier to get, but it was more expensive. So it cost money to get divorced. Who do you suppose stood to profit from this industry? Any cause is almost certainly, let's think about the any cause thing, because it's almost certainly what Joseph was thinking when he considered divorcing Mary quietly. Quietly being the technical term. He would graciously refuse to charge her with infidelity. And he would get an any cause divorce, even though he'd still have to pay the bridal inheritance. Joseph was a stand-up guy. Marriage in the ancient world at least, among, at least among the vast majority of social strata, was primarily a means of ensuring families' economic stability and social privileges by creating both offspring and interfamily alliances. But a woman's sexuality was essentially the property of her father, then of her husband. So at the time that Jesus is being asked this question by the Pharisees, Adultery, good news, is no longer punishable by death. And any cause divorce was popular among Jewish men. So for Jesus and the Pharisees, this topic of adultery, sexual immorality, and divorce, it's trending. Jesus is asked the question. They expect an answer, but Jesus goes down a different road. He calls out the Pharisees by saying, because of your hardness of heart, Moses wrote this commandment for you. Is it possible that money was changing hands? Was this becoming a divorce racket where Pharisees stood to make money off of this? I don't know. The Pharisees neglect to mention, when talking to Jesus, a key piece of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through which requires the husband to give the certificate of divorce to his ex-wife. Such a document might provide a divorced woman with a defense against rumor and slander. For a majority of women in that culture, survival depended on being a member of a household. A woman, perhaps, with children and without a husband, and without a means of explaining to people why she was unmarried, would be exposed to great risk. The law's provision about the certificate seeks to alleviate that risk. But the Pharisees, they leave that part out. They find that detail not really worth noting. When Jesus mentions divorce in the Gospels, He's articulating his position 
on the Shammai Hillel debate. Now, biblical literalists will point out that Jesus said, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. But Jesus said, God created them male and female. And it says it right there in black and white in Genesis. And it says it there in red letters in the New Testament. But then Jesus tells the disciples a little bit later, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. If she divorces her husband and marries another, then she commits adultery. And the passage concludes with another story about how important children are. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but this is the third week in a row that Jesus punctuates his radical teaching with a story of children being hindered. Jesus elevates children once again. He's elevating the status of children. And another remarkable twist, Jesus makes it subtle, but powerful, powerful in this passage is the elevation of women in this story. Because Jesus puts women on the same level as men. This may seem strange to some of you in these times, but this was a radical concept that male and female are created equal by God. It says a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two, the two become one. One, they become equal partners. And Jesus goes even further by saying that in divorce, both husband and wife are equal. Jesus is ushering in a socioeconomic revolution. Women and children were vulnerable. Women and children, they were cast off. They were cast aside. And there's a reason why in Mosaic law, the Jews are told to leave the leftover crops in the field. Don't go back for the extra crops. Crops are left behind for those who were left behind by social class. Widows, children, immigrants, women falsely accused by men, the women whose stories and whose defenses were not believed and were left to pick up the pieces of their shattered and exposed lives. The poorest, the weakest, the vulnerable. So when Jesus is asked the question about divorce, he wasn't being asked, what do you think about divorce? He was being asked, are you with us? Jesus, are you with us? Jesus' response, and I'm paraphrasing, Pharisees, I know that this is a radical idea and this is going to completely blow your mind. But men and women are equal in the sight of God. Men and women are equal in the sight of God, Pharisees. Are you with me? Are you with me? Amen.